Hi everyone, my name is Eloise Nicholas and I'm the Photography Facilitator at the Hugh Bird University Centre. Today I'm going to be going through a, um, a short PowerPoint uh, with you to explore mobile phone photography and social media. Um, the essence of today's uh, talk is a bit like a mini lecture. Um, what I want you to do is to, what I want you to take away from this is that it's not just um, the cameras we're looking at it's how we view images and that you're able to go away and make a photography just something that you have a pocket um you don't need to worry about buttons worry about settings it's more what do you see and uh, we're going to look at various different um photographers and artists of whom have started to use or have based their practice on the mobile phone and how it has um changed how we take photography um made a lot of documentary but it's not just there it's also how we how um people start to find more photographers and how they're able to get jobs through social media through their following and generally just sharing um so i'm just going to share with my screen with you now and we'll get started Excellent. So what we're going to be talking through today is exploring the archive, um, the rise of the mobile phone photographer and social media and how it's changing um, the photography industry. So when I start to talk about the, um, the archive, what we would think about are our personal archives. And essentially that's just a really posh way of saying, you know that box of photos that you have underneath the stairs? That would be a personal archive of you, of your family. It's um, a place where you've documented, um, you know, happy times, holidays, significant events. You know, you might have documentation in there, birth certificates, marriage certificates. Um, really odd bits of of paper but essentially when you put them all together you create this archive of a life whether it be yours or or um one of your past relatives your grandparents are probably a great one for this but what we see now is we're starting to get a bit more of um a, a bit more of an evolution in the personal archive by using our mobile phones. So originally, you know, you'd be quite precious with what you took uh, photographs of. So at the dawn of photography, it was exceptionally expensive. Um, it would be something that you would have done once, maybe a couple of times in your lifetime. And obviously it started to get cheaper, but it's still at an expense. You could buy film, you pay for developing. So you become quite precious of what you pictures of. Um, when you'd go on holiday, you'd sit there and wonder whether or not it was one of the 36 exposures that you would have on your um, disposable camera. So what we then have is an archive of, of significant moments, mainly of happy times, but it could also be, you know, meals, mainly weddings, birthdays, particular outings that you have. And you create a very specific view of somebody's life. Um, and you don't get an idea of what they're like when in the everyday. And I guess this is where mobile phones generally start to take over. We don't have to pay for film. We don't have to pay for developing. It's there in our pockets and it's and there's it's there in our hands. So we they're not overly precious. It means that. Yes, we can take wonderful pictures of the happy times, of our holidays, of the times that we go and meet our friends. I mean, especially now where that's more pre more precious than ever. But we also take things of the everyday, um, you know, receipts. What did you have for lunch? You know, shop buildings. I know very much that my phone is filled with pictures of of books which are on my to buy list and uh, you know, the screenshots from Instagram of artists. That quite like that it wouldn't necessarily be fine anywhere else. You find that they become memories. You take pictures of notes that you've taken in class. You take pictures of a presentation you're in a in a conference um, of 
timetable of bus timetables so you're able to sit there and think um and just really really odd stuff. we find that not only are we physical beings where we you know get to touch things but we're now digital beings as well and we get to take pictures of our digital lives so screenshots from instagram snapchat etc um we also have screenshots of conversations so we're able to actually document these digital conversations that we have emails whatsapp anything like that and then when you start to put all of these together you now have this this archive of a whole person of a full life of which you can now put all together so it's not just the significant moments and the happy times what what else has happened in the everyday even the time where you've taken a selfie so you can distract yourself before going up to do a presentation those kind of things they become a lot more true and honest form of documentary do documentary and that's where the main main change is starting to occur now uh, is in documentary photography in particular There's a lot more comfort so in situations you might feel comfortable of taking a picture in a certain situation you can now you know it's that odd thing that you've seen on the bus or on the train somebody walking down the road and you'll remember that and um you know you might already have it in your hand you might drive around in a car and you quickly snap something that you might not have seen otherwise it's very very interesting actually what we start to collect um actually what does our life look like when it's not just that significant moment so now we're starting to get to the stage where we have where everybody has a mobile uh, where pretty much everybody has a camera phone um they're stuck in our hands so what is it about the mobile phone photography which is starting to evolve within our photographic practice so how have photographers adapted and um we're now also starting to see that there's now recognition towards photographers who use mobile phones as their primary equipment and we're also going to have a little look at what social media has done to change so it's not necessarily just picking up your phone i mean if you want to create me um stunning meaningful images you still need to think like a photographer you don't need to have the big dslr you can still think like a photographer and get amazing pictures so when you go out look look with your eyes and not just glance think about things like composition your framing the light you don't need to have a lighting equipment the sun is a wonderful thing and there is an art to natural light photography but there's things like rule of thirds um the golden ratio using things with with empty space to try and draw the eye closer think about getting down low changing the perspective of your images but these are all things that you can go away and practice with with no cost all of these would translate over if you just then decided to go and buy a camera but it's not necessary our cameras whilst the sensor might be small our cameras are getting better and better as they go along we can still print these pictures and this is probably one of the best ways to try and learn go outside even if you're stuck in your house have a look where the light is shining from where are those shadows being cast and that's what's going to make more of an interesting picture than something just straight on change your perspective but this is how a photographer thinks it's not so much changing your equipment it's changing your mindset and how you look at things so now I'm going to start introducing you to a few photographers who have actually either adapted to using a mobile phone, whose practice is mainly mobile phone, is mainly using a mobile phone, and um, a couple of other bits and pieces. So this is um, not this picture. This is one of his pictures. This is Frazan Ahmed. So when he moved to Lahore, um, out of Pakistan, he all he did is he went and bought a really cheap an android um camera phone and he started walking around lahore and he's now created a book called a photo book called lahore by metro 
he went around with his with his little camera phone documenting what he saw on the metro system um then using kickstarter he's managed to fund his uh photo book and get that published he was completely um self-taught he just went out and practiced he borrowed books from his local library and he eventually moved on to getting a camera which he uses for um specific assignments and paid work but he still mainly uses his mobile phone because it's so easy to transport and people don't look at you necessarily with a camera phone we're really quite blind to them now they're just so part of our everyday life compared to whipping a camera out next there's robert Harmon. Now, Robert Harmon is already an established photographer. However, um, he released his photo book, the mobile phone photo book. Um, and what this allowed him to do was using the pictures of which, he's, which he um, took using his camera phone, um, he then consolid um, consolidated that, them down into a photo book. All of these were used um, all of these were taken using just an iPhone. Um, what he wanted was the chance to be able to make this digital experience analog as in physical. Um, it was an opportunity for getting the viewer to actually linger at the image and not being distracted by notifications that were coming up, by um, being separated by a screen, um, separated by text around the pictures. Um, so that's what his photo book, um, that's what he wanted his photo book to do, to translate these digital pictures that he just took on his phone into something more physical. And that's another way of being able to look and seeing how images translate um onto further media but you can go on lens culture and you can find out more about this book again but it's pushing the boundaries of photography and it's move it's trying to drop the barriers down of what photography is it's not just using a specific camera it's using things that capture images so it is phones and then for some people a camera is a pinhole camera, which is essentially a box with a hole in it. So it depends on what your definition of camera is. And we're starting to break down the barriers. I mean, especially as they're starting to get better, better, qual um, better and better qualities. The next part we're going to talk about is um, Zuka, uh, Zuka Kontrakans. So he's a Polish photographer and all of his work is done on um a camera phone he is award-winning um he was the 2009 to uh, 2019 and 2020 newcomer award in the tel Aviv photo uh, festival he's a finalist in Unis um at unesco and various other ones he sells his work he sells his prints of his photos he's got a very very large photo um photographic following on Instagram, which can become more relevant as I go on. It proves that we are starting to get more and more recognition on images that are actually taken through camera phones. Again, using the same ideas that a, for, uh, that a normal, uh, I say normal photographer, that a traditional photographer would have. It's composition, it's light, it's composition, framing, lighting, cropping. It's all of those things. And all we're doing is we're translating them to a device of which is just in your pocket. So now we're, um, now we've got more awards happening. This is a, um, a particularly famous one, the Mobile Photography Awards. Um, and their deadline for this year is in December, so you've got plenty of time. If you go on their website, you can see all the work um, that, have, that has won and short comers and things like that. And it's an absolute wealth of information, proving once again, you do not need a large camera. Some of the works throughout this are absolutely stunning and all just taken using mobile phones. This recognition means that it's um, becoming more and more common and more and more recognized, which then opens up jobs and opportunities. 
So the one on the right was taken using an iPhone 11 and so on. But a lot of these people use um, a Galaxy um, cameras as well. I believe uh, Zuka takes all of his work with a using a Samsung Galaxy. These are some more. You can also go to um, IEM, that's E-Y-E-E-M, and that's a blog of mobile phone photographers. Well, there's a wealth of information on there, and you're able to go and find um, some more photographers on there if you want to get some inspiration and to see how their work is being pushed. The other thing that you need to think about is you have apps, free apps that are exceptionally cheap ones, which are a lot cheaper than buying um, uh, than buying some programs that you're able to use. And don't limit yourself to filters. Filters won't do you any justice. Um, try using more. Um, try using more apps like Snapseed or Lightroom Mobile or Polar and things like that, that will allow you to actually go in and change the brightness, the contrast and all the fiddly bits and pieces. So you can actually tailor your photo to how you want it to look and not just a pre-made filter made by somebody else that might not necessarily suit the image. So that's the other thing that you might want to um, think about because that will allow you to explore black and white, explore vibrance, how sharp do you want your pictures? It will then also allow you to crop your pictures down so you can play with framing. It's all of these little bits and pieces that we're taking from a regular photography practice and now able to translate to small devices. Now the biggest uh, elephant in the room is actually the use of social media. Now some of these photographers I'm gonna show you have done their work using cameras, however, all of this can also be translated to your phones and it's how social media is being utilized within our industry today. So it's how do photographers um, use social media to promote and market their practice and how the industry is changing. How are we getting seen and how, how is work being created from this? So the first person that I'm gonna talk about here is Niall McDermott. So with his main practice he started going out um and exploring just taking photographs of random people um of strangers apparently you know he'd go to a train station look at the boards of all the trains that were leaving and then just go i'm going to go there you know somewhere out just outside of london and then just go and explore ask people if he can take their photographs which is really really interesting and it was pretty much just a personal project he then started posting all of this on social media and um, developing a really um, sizable following on Instagram, just of the random places and the random people that they've seen. Um, and his work got noticed by the picture editors um, for London Fashion Week. And he was then commissioned by London Fashion Week to photograph and to do it in the same style of what he was doing as he was going around London and the outskirts, taking pictures of people. So this in a way is how we're able to use um, social media to govern our own digital space. Um, we can tailor our own images. This was just a personal project for him, but he found a, a viewership whom was interested in his work we're able to tailor who sees our work we can become exceptionally niche and not just be limited to what will um what a picture editor is wanting at that period of time because there'll always be somebody who wants to look at your work and this is how picture editors are starting to find um more and more artists is through social media The next photographer that we've got here is Mimi Mollica. Now, he is kind of known as a social media monster. He is exceptionally engaged in his following. Um, he has collated a raft of followers, both on, on Instagram and Facebook and various other platforms. 
he engages with them and this is the next this is the next point and i understand that a lot of you already know a lot of this but he engages with his audience he comments he sends messages he answers questions and he gets everybody very very much engaged and again this was a personal project for him and he used his following to um create a kickstarter campaign for a photo book that he wanted to produce um and with Kickstarter, essentially, you get about thirty days to be able to. You say, "I want to, uh, I want to raise uh, five thousand pounds," and you get thirty days to raise that. If you don't raise it, it doesn't get funded. He wanted to raise about eight thousand pounds for his photo book, and in thirty-six hours, he got twelve thousand um, pounds. As you can see here. Um, so with 299 backers, he's raised 18,000 pounds. And this is because he cultivated his following, which was then able to easily fund his photo book that he wanted to produce. And obviously, you know, as all these things go, they come with gifts and benefits, but it's that level of connection that helped him. He also uses the idea of drip feeding information. So it's taking the taking his viewers and his followers on a journey. So it's not just pictures of the final product. It's behind the scenes of a shoot. It's pages from the book and, you know, sitting there going, you know, and when the Kickstarter went, you know, he then went to go and tour it and so on and so forth. So it's lots of little bits of information to keep everybody essentially in this loop. Like they were all working together. Um and sharing it over multiple platforms to make sure that he tried to get a wide breadth of viewership. The next aspect that we're gonna look at here is Brooklyn Beckham. Now you can see there that he's got, well, at the time of the screenshot, he had 12.2 um, million followers. What this leads to is advertisers and branding agents, um, commissioning photographers of whom have a following to um for work because they know that they're going to get a guaranteed audience and this was done in this case where he was then commissioned for the for the burberry campaign and we can see um this has happened multiple times you will probably see it a lot more um throughout your own feeds depending on whom you're following but, um this is a, another way that work is starting to come out of social media. It's not just showing off your work. It's actually how you gain work as well um, because they want to be able to almost guarantee a viewership, an audience, and people who can already buy into their products. But um, this moves on to slightly... Um, things now again thinking about photo editors but also how um both photo editors and photographers are starting to push the industry um and push their practice a bit more this is louisa door so she was issued she was commissioned by times magazine um to photograph the 25 um innovative women of the day and this led to all these times photographs all of these were taken on an iphone um they wanted to they wanted to push that not only are these women innovative and um the first to do whatever it is in their field you know it, it was it was politicians, musicians, actresses, etc. cetera. Um, these were all done using an iPhone, proving that you don't need the big fancy camera to take pictures of celebrities. And then we also have Christopher Anderson, who's a Magnum photographer. Um, he uses an i he uses his iPhone regularly. I mean, so much so that Apple then commissioned him to um, shoot their um, to shoot their campaign advert for their new iPhone. Um, he 
is a great advocate for pushing the photography medium um, and using whatever um, whatever methods he can. He's not he's he's not so much a snob as many of the people in the industry, though that is starting to change. Um, so he wanted to push a lot more of his pictures. And again, this has moved to taking another Times cover that he was, well, if you read the caption there, it said, you know, it was taken in his, um, in his front room. And this one is one of the most recent ones, and it will lead on to the uh, the last artist that I'm going to show you after this. Um, he was commissioned by the New Yorker, and this image was taken using Zoom throughout lockdown. So our, uh, photographers are now not only going for their phone, but they're using anything that captures an image, including their laptops and using those so we're able to do things from a distance so now geography isn't um isn't an issue in many cases we don't need to all meet up in the in a very remote location to go in these go and do these specific shoots so this is the work of um a brazilian photographer elizaveta padrona and um these are the maternity pictures of Chloe Savenji. Um, and these again were taken over Zoom over lockdown whilst Chloe was in New York and Elisavita was in Brazil, I believe. Um, there's a lot of, uh, so wh whilst in the article, it didn't fully explain how they took the photographs. There would have been an awful lot of collaboration between um, the model and the photographer. So in regards to, can you move your laptop here? Can you move your laptop there? Can you kind of get into this position? So it's a lot more to do about communication and then the processing afterwards. But this was taken at the at the height of the pandemic, where um, New York was the epicenter of the worst of it. And Chloe, who was forty five, um, was in the, her ninth month of being pregnant, and wanted to capture, you know, these last moments. And obviously, she couldn't get a photographer around. And um, she started talking with Elita about um, about doing a shoot. So. Uh, again, they say that the the main success was the unfettered broadband from there. So essentially, it's taking advantages of all the image capturing tools that you have, your phone, your tablet, your laptop screen. It's how you want to capture your images and not um, and not just pigeonhole yourself. Don't limit yourself to, um, thinking that you need to have this equipment, you can use anything. Again, you can use a box with a hole in it and a little piece of film. So this uh, this was just a quick taster just to try and get you to think about how you'd go around taking some images and um, that you're just not limited to your equipment. Thanks. So do I think well, phones will overtake photography? Um, no, not in, a, not in a strict sense, but they will eventually come on par with them. Um, a lot more is going to be used with them, especially as the cameras get more and more powerful. But again, the sensors are still quite small. Um, I don't think it's ever gonna fully overtake it, but they will be like big brother and little brother. What for what photography courses do we do? Um, so we do the FAD, um, sorry, not the FAD, we do the foundation diploma, um, the foundation degree, sorry, in photography and digital imaging. And we also do the BA top up for three years. Yes, you can take the time. Uh, you can always give us a call and we can um, 
help try and tailor the course a bit more for you. But you can study. Uh, we do our classes. We make sure that we have for full-time students, we always put our classes on for two full days a week because the majority of our students are adult learners and we understand that we need to try and um, tailor around people's work as well. So you can stay full-time and still work, but we do also do part-time. The courses start in September. Whilst we um, really, yes, should have your own equipment, um, just because it's going to make certain activities easier, especially when you, you know, go away at the end of the week and take pictures. We do have, have a lot of equipment that we are able to sell as well, but have our own advantages, but not necessary. Um, yes, so in regards to funding, you can go through Student Finance, Finance England, but uh, for more information on that, I'd call up the college and speak to one of our uh, finance officers. Um, and we also do bursaries. Um, we also do bursaries as well for our students. Um, but again, if you phone up and inquire about the course, we have to tell you a bit more about that. So that's the last question for today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed and I look forward to hearing from you all soon. Thanks. Please get in touch.